This is the Met Police Training Centre for armed officers in Gravesend, Kent. Here, the elite officers tasked with responding to London's life and death incidents learn how to take and save a life. My name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the Sun's crime editor, and I've been granted access behind the scenes to see for myself the extreme pressure and intense scrutiny that officers go through when responding to such dangerous situations. On average, there are around 4,000 armed incidents a year in the capital and another 800 pre-planned operations which officers who carry guns will turn out on. Those cops that respond to them are in units that have undergone hundreds of hours of extra training before they're deployed onto the streets. It's one of the most dangerous areas of policing and not just a physical danger but the risks that officers carry in terms of the backlash from the law afterwards. They not only risk their lives, but also their freedoms. In September of last year, around 300 of them downed their weapons in protest after a colleague was charged with murder. Following that rebellion, then Home Secretary Suella Braverman ordered an accountability review of policing to establish whether officers were being treated fairly under the current system. Met Police Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley is calling for urgent reforms to make things fairer for his officers, who can sometimes face years of scrutiny for their handling of life and death incidents. I've come here to the Met's training facility to understand what goes into making an armed officer and how they react when they're facing dangers on the streets of the capital to protect the public. Specialist Firearms Command in the Met is known as MO19 and we start our tour in the museum where the scale of the capital's firearms problem is clear to see. This one was made by a prisoner uh, in one of Her Majesty's prisons, made in the machine shop and then subsequently found on a prison search. Uh, it fires a single shot 2-2 bullet. This one uh, is a large calibre target revolver with a machined grip for a machine to an individual's hand with a suppressor and a, an optical sighting system on it for a large calibre target shooting. This yeah, is more it. of a conventional, what we class as a self-loading pistol, and so it's semi-automatic, it's not fully automatic. Um, very, very common, comes in many different forms. Works on a, ma a magazine with bullets in it, and as soon as you squeeze the trigger after making it ready, the gun will recycle itself, I say it will put another round in the chamber to make it ready to fire again. So this is 90% of modern day weapons will work on, on pistols. Not all the items here can kill you, and it's hard to know, even close up, whether a firearm is genuine or not. So all the, uh, the weapons that are on this side uh, are all completely fake. They're completely inert, will not fire any form of projectile whatsoever. Uh, the weapons that they carry on this side are real viable guns and will discharge a bullet. There is no visual difference. Weight is quite a key thing, but to work out that it's heavier than something else, you've actually got to be that close to pick it up or, or handle it. And as for what officers might encounter on the street? It's very hard to tell nowadays. It, it, it really, really is. I mean, the, some of the stuff in here is, is up to 100 years old. Some of it is relatively modern. It's, you really do not know. You really do, just don't know what is currently out there. There are around 3,000 firearms officers in the Met who carry out different roles. All of them must complete a set amount of training each year to keep their firearms blue ticket. For senior officers, that can total 250 hours of training annually. That exercise was a training scenario in relation to either a counter-terrorist exercise or a hostage rescue, whereupon life is at risk, uh, and that particular method of entry is util utilised where life is at risk or other exceptional circumstances. The next exercise we're shown is modelled on the Bataclan theatre attack in Paris back in November 2015, in which 130 people died. 
we have a club premises here, so two floors. Uh, we, there's no light inside there apart from strobe lights, and we have loud music. So we're looking at taking out um, a lot of the senses that police officers and everyone uh, deals with. So they're going to go in. There's two armed suspects inside the club, uh, multiple injured people inside. So we deploy the two ARVs to save life in, inside the address. So their main role there is to um, hopefully to confront and neutralise the threat. Shots fired. In this scenario, officers storm a nightclub before assessing the carnage which the terrorist suspects have inflicted. Downstairs we have four fatalities and one person with a penetrating chest wound. Upstairs there's a large number of people that um, have got catastrophic bleeds or penetrating chest wounds from the gunshots. So we've got two what we call nesting sites, one upstairs, one downstairs. One upstairs is the busiest one, so if we go in we can unwalk you through it. So as soon as there's no longer a threat, they just have to stop. They have to spin, change caps, or almost like a medic cap. And from there, they just start triaging everybody inside that building. So you have to find everyone, treat everyone, stop them bleeding, keep them breathing. Once everyone's been found and you've done that rapid intervention, life-saving uh, treatment, then you can get onto comms, get everyone to come, come to you to help you. But then once you've got that time, then you start doing real medicine work. So we're looking at stripping them down, finding the wounds that are going to kill them slow, um, expose the wounds that are going to, we're going to kill them quick, get oxygen, those that need oxygen, open the airways, the, the people that are unresponsive. Um, from then onwards, we just need to keep them warm, get help to us as quick as possible, because ultimately they need to go to hospital. They're not going to survive just by laying on the floor with our treatment. And when you have ARVs dealing with someone that's been attacked, that had acid thrown on them, stabbed, run over, shot, ARVs are the best people to be dealing with that initial trauma. We get inundated with emails to say that their initial interventions have saved life and if it wasn't for them with their skills and the kit that they've got, these people would die. Firearms officers can use their medical training to respond to life-threatening situations that may not involve weapons and they often do. So this is enhanced medic training. Those two vehicles down there are uh, the response vehicles and you can see we've got a number of casualties uh, in yeah. the street, live casualties as well. So the instructors are finding out from the students at the moment what the injuries are. The students are making their assessment of those injuries and then responding accordingly. Last year, more than 800 incidents were attended by firearms officers which did not involve guns and which required specialist medical help. They save lives as well as, rarely, on occasions, taking them. The guys and girls out on the streets of London are very, very highly trained medics. They consistently and persistently respond to 999 calls. 66 times uh, during November, they responded to life-saving incidents outside of firearms incidents. One of the first exercises potential firearms undergo it's a simulated incident in the judgment range aimed at testing an officer's ability to make decisions under extreme pressure. Obviously it replicates the handgun that they would normally have but like I say it's just full of electrics. I know you've had a squeeze of the trigger and if you pull it it will make a bang. So the system will pick up the bang. The system knows where the laser's pointing at the time when it makes the bang so it shows where it where the person's been shot. The instructors can change the outcomes of the scenario as they play out, presenting officers with alternative endings to the incidents. So you drive past a school, yeah. uh, there are multiple uh, phone calls about uh, an active shooter, many people, children, saying someone's been shot, someone's been shot, and you have to do um, like a single person emergency entry to confront that shooter. So other units are on their way, so you might come across some other cops, so don't shoot them. Hopkins! Okay, stick the gun down. We'll play the video back yeah. and it will stop on each round you fired, so we can see now on the screen how it pans out. I reckon it's gone through his arm in and into that, green. yeah, into her sternum. It's shown on the system, no hit zone, so it's shown as a miss. So you shot the girl in the green. As the scenario played back on screen, 
instructors rigorously interrogated my decision making and I have to admit it wasn't up to much. So the person with the gun, were they definitely the person that had shot the casualties? He had a, a gun, he was up, holding up a gun and the people in that room were frightened of him. They were? That's what I thought. Maybe a student that had taken the gun off the marauding gunman? And he's holding the gun going, wow, that's amazing. I managed to get the gun off the bad guy and he's run off. So innocent student, hero maybe. Everybody relax, police officers, look, I've got the gun. I've taken it off him. Everyone's safe now, I'm the hero. Bang, 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 dead. I thought that they were standing back against the wall. Um, and that to me suggested that they were in fear of him. So when you shot him and he fell on the floor, mm. did he drop the gun? I did look to see if he still had the gun and I didn't see it. You didn't see the gun? No. So why did you shoot him again? Because I just wanted to make sure he was dead. I mean, you're saying you wanted to make sure he was dead, so that's attempted murder even if he doesn't die. Yes, I thought he was a risk to the other people but in the room. Because of the gun? Because of But you don't know where the gun was? At that point, no. Could you see both his hands? No. What colour was the floor? White. And what colour was the gun? Black. So pretty easy to, yeah. to see the gun. Couldn't take the chance that he didn't still have that gun and would therefore be a risk to the other people in the room. Do you think you shot him in the back? I think I did. You didn't consider that he might not be able to hear and you just shot him in the back. You shot him once, he fell over. You weren't sure where the gun was, so you shot him another, what, five, six times to make sure he was dead? It sounds like murder. The experience was quite humbling. Hopefully, you would shoot the bad guy, he would fall over, drop the gun. You wouldn't shoot him anymore, you would go forward, secure the gun and give life-saving first aid until the ambulance gets there, they take him away, everybody's happy. I felt mentally fatigued from my first attempt, but on the second occasion, I was more successful. You've dropped off your colleague. Uh, there is a, a, a domestic uh, dispute. A neighbour has heard the next door neighbour shouting and arguing. They've been shouting and arguing a few times. Please present yourself. Control basically say there have been a number of calls to that house in the past three months. Police have gone. There's, uh, there's never been any injuries, there's never been any sign of disturbance. Both the male and female occupant of the house have said it was just a loud disagreement. Control, there appears to be nobody present at the, this address at the time. Now going up the stairs. There are voices. Please present yourself. Control, urgent backup required. Present yourself now. So going through the, the bottom of the house, yeah. you announce yourself as police. Certainly in the initial bit, I didn't see anything that would have caused any concern. Anything, no. do you notice anything that seemed a bit out of the ordinary? There are no definitive outcomes in these scenarios. More important is testing the officer's ability to focus under extreme pressure and justify their actions when faced with the decision to take a life or not. And then you, you said that you heard a woman's voice. Yes, yeah, that looked to me like that. A distressed woman and a, okay. a male voice that seems to be threatening. This is not an exact science, as human factors are involved. Mistakes can be made, sometimes with fatal consequences. But there is no doubt from what we have seen about the rigorous and professional training which these officers undergo. Stop it! Stop it! 